Uh, afternoon, everybody. Well, we're just going to uh, get underway, and I'll, I'll ask the um, committee advisor to to start the recording. Here we are. Okay. Um, I'd like to invite Councillor Karako to open the meeting with a karakia and a mihi fakato. Thank you. Uh, e mihi atu uh, kākoe te kai whakahai re uh, o te committee uh, Pai Afina o te putia, ori rai mihi atu. A koutou rā, a tēnā koutou. A ko tēnei karakia tīmataka, a e hui hui e tākata. Taka ka taka, tā tāka tō mōtoi, e kapo i te whetu, e kapo i te mārama, e kapo i tata, e taku rau kiro kei rire. Uturu mau ki a whakamaua ka tīna. Tīna, haumie, huie, taikie. A ko tēnei hoi anō, a ko tēnei a, mihi a, e hui hui e tākata. O reira ka me nui ki te mihi atu ki tō tātou matu nui te raki, a koe te timataka me te whakaute ko tau katoa. O reira ka mihi au ki te kai humai o ka mea pai katoa. Ka mau mahara mātou ki a rātou kai tua ko e tau wairua. E nō reira e koutou rā e marai o ia iwi o ia waka, Aere roke ki tā rō te whānui a tānei ko tua tā rai, haere, haere e haere atu rā. Anō reira ka mau maharatia um, o te kua hinga e te tōtara. O reira e haere atu rā e whaā nāna e Festo Collins. Mō tō uh, māngai o te pāti kakariki mō tō whānau o te moana nui a kiwa. Anō reira e whiso, e haere atu rā, haere atu rā ki te pāta whakawairua, takoto, takoto, takoto. E whiso, haere atu rā e Hawaii ki nui, Hawaii ki rō, Hawaii ki pāmamo. Anō reira e te whānau pani, a ki a kaha, ki a maia, a ki a manawa nui, uh, me tō kua hinga o te tō tōtara. O reira e koutou rā, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, āpiti hono o tātai hono, uh, rātou ki tōngo mate, ki tōngo mate ki a rātou, āpiti hono o tātai hono tātou, a ki tōngo ora, ki tōngo ora ki a tātou. Nō reira, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, e mihi, e mihi, mihi atu. Uh, I just stand here as to do as I've done um, the Karakia Tumataka, which actually talks about a feathered bloom that actually falls. And it signifies actually then the falling of a totara um, in the forest of Tane. So I just wanted to acknowledge Professor Collins, actually, who tragically um, passed away this morning. And uh, I acknowledged all of our whānau from um, the Pacific, Pacifica, and then also um, those uh, colleagues of his in Parliament, because he was a member of Parliament for the Green Party, um, and also uh, an important uh, member, particularly of the Auckland constituency. So, uh, yeah, I just did that actually as an acknowledgement um, uh, for his passing. And also to finish with um, wishing his whānau um, well, our love, and all of that, that is needed, going to be very much needed this time. Um, and finished it by saying, let the dead be the dead and the living be the living. Kia ora, Nami. Kia ora. Thank you, Nook. Um, welcome, everybody, to the meeting. Um, I've been informed that there's a quorum present, and I'm pleased to declare the meeting open. Uh, just to advise, agenda uh, item 9.2.3, the legal update um, in our PX will be taken at 2.30, um, which may re require the agenda item uh, 9 to be moved to this item if the meeting has not reached uh, this item by that time. The order of the reports will then continue in the order shown on the agenda. Um, not aware of any apologies or any conflicts of interest. There are no public forum deputations or petitions. 
and there's no extraordinary and urgent business and there are no notices of motion. So we'll head to um, agenda item number 7.1, which is the unconfirmed minutes of the Audit, Finance and Risk Committee of 1st of November. On page 10, are there any matters of accuracy relating to the minutes of the meeting for that day? None. Then I'll put the motion that the Audit, Finance and Risk Committee confirms the minutes from the Audit, Finance and Risk Committee meeting held on the 1st of November 2023. Do I have a mover? Genevieve, seconder, Graham McGlynn. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Item 8.1. Is the Audit, Finance and Risk Committee Resolution Status Report, February. It's on page 18. And uh, so I asked Giles to just briefly talk to those. Uh, yeah, so this is the status of the current recommendations. There are a couple that are uh, currently in progress. Um, there is a briefing arranged with Council on the Forestry and land use uh, as requested, that's in the, the current schedule, and also there is work ongoing on the terms of reference and that will be brought back to this committee for endorsement prior to going to council for approval when ready. Thanks, Giles. Um, any other questions? None. Um, I'll put the motion then that the Audit, Finance and Risk Committee notes the status of previous resolutions provided in the Audit, Finance and Risk Committee Resolution Status Report, February 2024. We have a mover. McGray McGlynn, Councillor Sunkel, seconded. Any discussion? No discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried, thank you. Uh, the next paper, page uh, 24, is the BAM Corp Treasury Report, and I invite um, Brian Elliott, uh, Chief Financial Officer, and David Walker from BAM Corp Treasury to present the, the report. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me again. Um, do today is we'll just run through the report uh, reasonably quickly. It's reasonably straightforward, um, but it's one of those situations where a couple of weeks has been a long time in the financial markets, and there's a couple of topical pieces that I'd like to cover off potentially in the end. And also, too, um, I'd like to thank sort of the value adders of questions that um, I or we get um, at the end of this piece as well. So, just so in terms of the policy compliance, and again, these are all numbers um, as of um, 31 December, um, as to be expected, uh, uh, you're fully compliant. Um, all the key measures uh, are very comfortable, uh, which reflects you know, strong management, strong liquidity. Uh, average, average cost of funds is fine. Uh, you've got a good spread of maturity dates, um, and there's, there's really nothing there that I can see that would be a, a, of any concern. So that's that's all good news, and that's all a green light for those particular sections. Uh, again, um, that again, uh, top left column, sorry, top left uh, graph that just shows where your uh, fixed rate position is in terms of the policy. Um, so it's all comfortably compliant. Uh, bottom left basically shows your what what we believe will be your cost of funds based on the market rates as of 31 December. Uh, thing, things changed that since then, but I'll come back to that. And then there's just some other numbers there as well. But again, just reflecting that you are uh, fully compliant. Right, so what what is Bancorp going to be doing with you and your management over the, over the next quarter? So uh, we've got no, no need for any additional fixed rate hedging for the next five months, but obviously that will depend on market conditions and it will depend on any, any, any extra debt requirements. Um, that have occurred since 31 December. Uh, what we're going to do uh, with the 10 million of debt maturing March 24 and September 24, we're going to push push that out to 2026. Uh, the reason for that is 
Um, a it gives us a bit more security. Uh, the rating companies like to see that as well from a refinancing risk point of view. Um, I'll come back to the rating companies um, in a moment or two because I think some of their comments about the sector you'll find of interest. Um, and obviously, we're just ongoing work with ECAN finance management team around any new borrowing and optimising your interest costs. OK, so what's on our mind for the coming quarter? Again, this is where things have changed quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. So uh, the Reserve Bank is to be closely watched as the market is priced in and is expecting significant rate cuts over the next 18 months. Now, a, a graph I've got coming up um, shows how quickly or how fickle uh, the market is. You know, if we go back to even early January, uh, the market was pricing in six rate cuts and that to occur reasonably quickly over 24 and early part of 25. ANZ came out Friday a week ago, uh, now forecasting two rate increases in February and May. Now, as a Bancorp view and as a personal view, I think that's a bit of an outlier, so uh, I don't expect that to happen. But I do have some sympathy with the general view that rates remain high or slightly longer than what the market has, has expected. Um, the key issue for New Zealand is the level of non-tradable inflation. While Inflation at the sort of consumer level is, is is looking in the going in the right sort of direction, or the overall overall inflation inflation is going in the right direction. There's a, a lot of uh, inflation which appears to be quite sticky, and that comes from things that you'd be aware of, like uh, rates, insurances, electricity, um, probably ongoing pay rises as well. So it kind of just helps. Well, it helps, but it, it sort of um, it's just a reminder that inflation may not fall as quickly as many people have thought, which has implications from an interest rate point of view. Um, so if we look uh, overseas at the US Federal Reserve, uh, again, the market got carried away um, at the end of the last year. They were expecting rate, six rate cuts. That uh, expectations come down to three. And so I think in the year ahead, we're just going to have this ongoing tension between the, the market, who basically want to see rate cuts aggressively and soon, whereas the global central banks will see strong evidence that inflation is is, is coming back to that 2% sort of target level. Now, the reminder there is that last leg of inflation, which will be the hard bit from the sort of 2 to 3.5%, which I think we'll find particularly tough. Um, and again, this last graph here, uh, that goes to show Again, these were the numbers before the ANZ came out, that the, the vast range of differences in opinion between the different banks in terms of what their forecasts will be for New Zealand rates and also in terms of what the market is um, forecasting. So again, as of that graph there, uh, ANZ was projecting some really big falls in interest rates quite soon. Uh, they've now changed their mind. Why they've quite done that, I really don't know. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's their prerogative, shall we say. So that is kind of the, the key part of the report. But I thought another aspect that you might find of interest, um, and I don't want you to find this too concerning, but um, Standard & Poor's came out uh, three days ago and they made a general comment on the local authority sector. One of the, one of the six criteria that they, they measure is a means of uh, gauging where all local authorities sit. There's something called the institutional framework. Now, at the moment, from a New Zealand perspective, the institutional framework is a one, which is the best possible score. They've put out that because of the uncertainty around government funding, particularly in relation to uh, three waters, they're thinking about revising that rating from a one to a two. Uh, so, so, so subsequently to that, um, I think it's seven or nine councils have been put on, on a negative outlook in terms of their credit rating. If it does come through that S&P do change that rating from a one to a two, and just as a reminder that we'll probably wait for the three water situation is resolved one way or the other, that could mean uh, a, a credit downgrade of one notch. So for example, you would fall from AA plus to AA. Now, as a reminder though, your Fitch rather than standard and pause, uh, but Fitch may, well, typically the credit ratings, the, the same criteria that they, they all kind of follow. But I think the key thing to note, that it will be a longer term sort of situation over probably over the next um, 18 months before that is clarified. Um, if it does happen, it would happen across the sector. So it would be no reflection on ECAN itself. And the cost to ECAN is at five basis points. So it's, it's you know, from, you know, for example, from five to 505%, which would happen over extended period of time. 
So I'm just flagging that. So if the stuff that comes up in the media about that, um, just it, it, it's not a specific council focus. It's a sector approach. And from a rating point of view, even if it occurs, we're talking about degrees of excellence. Like at the moment, you have the same rating as the government. It doesn't get any better at that. So um, it, it's just just important to know. Um, it's interesting around this, um, what you've actually just said about this rating. So under the three waters, um, I'm just trying to find some kind of, um, what is the idea behind that? Is, is it um, because of the ways three waters was perceived, particularly from a treaty basis? Is that part of it? Or is it actually because what it's done, it's highlighted the, um, the, the, the the kind of dire standard of our water infrastructure, or is it a combination of the two of them? Um, it, it's just it's just really where the debt will sit. So um, under the Labor um, government's policies, the debt would have been shifted from councils to the new entities. So it's just it's just. And at the moment, it looks like the debt will remain at some form of council level. So it's just a case of where the debt sits. We're, we're watching that with great interest. But if you want to talk about that at another time, happy to. Yeah. Any other questions? Ian, can we just go back to, I think it was your, uh, maybe your first slide. There. No, next one. With writing on it. That, that one. So, so that um, second paragraph where you're talking about uh, debt maturing and and uh, over twenty percent, so which is outside the policy, and you wanted to bring it down to fifteen percent. Is there a danger that by doing that we're just going to lock in a higher proportion of our debt and a higher interest rate? No, well, we could, but no. Here, what we're going to be doing is just um, the two and a half year floating rate notes. So the, the interest rate is still based on the 90 day rate, but the actual physical maturity date of the, the loan facility is out for two and a half years. So, no, you're not, yeah. But, uh, so, and again, um, again, all we're trying to do is uh, just trying to keep the rating agencies as happy as we can. Uh, they, from a from a refinancing risk point of view, they prefer to have as little maturing in the, in the upcoming year as, as, as possible, really. So 15 to 20% is the, is the rule of thumb there. Thank you. Any other questions? Graham? <coughs> Pardon? Moving back one slide, if I may, to the debt egg cover there, we are towards the lower edges of the um, policy bands. And given the volatility in the market, um, certainly I'm seeing at other councils, uh, they've gone and locked in with the volatility at the right, if they've managed to score it at the right point, some additional cover to move themselves more towards the midpoint. And it's um, just given the high levels of volatility in those prices over this last month, and that's no predictor that there will be volatility going forward, of course. But I wouldn't mind your comments on that and where, where we're sitting. Yeah, um, that's, that's a fair question. Um, you know, we deal with um, probably two thirds of the councils in New Zealand, so we've got a pretty good feel of where everybody is. And, and so our view and, and our views of computers are actually pretty similar. But we we had a view that we thought, you know, a fair value rate for for getting our clients for, for long term hedging uh, was sort of three seventy five plus margin, of course. So that's kind of what we have been targeting. So we still think rates are too high. We still think rates will come down. Um, and the last thing we want to do. Is locking in for long term rates that you'll regret in coming years. So, you know, when we look at, um, you know, yeah, the future's unwritten, but in terms of where we think fair value and what are the rates that we're trying to achieve for you, that's that they're not here now, basically. With the um, underlying inflation and the embedded nature of it, you alluded to the rates going out. I think that was backing. Some of, some of the thoughts that uh, the rates won't drop as fast as people have been thinking, and that was part of the, the thinking behind it. Um, 
as we saw AMZ was a bit of an outlier in its forward curves, but the others were more consistent. Yeah. And um, it's just a, I just was interested in your comments as an expert. I'm just a lay observer. Oh, well, I appreciate your generous comment. Just on your three waters comments, um, involved in four other TAs, and one of the key issues when you strip them out and work out what's going to go across, that your income generated from the three waters assets compared to your debt loadings, it look like they're going to go well outside the 280 per cent that LGFA will um, be looking at doing. I've heard one draft number that had an eight in front of it. And so that's probably the affordability and the ability to finance these these um, new CCTOs um, is going to be an interesting issue, which fortunately this council doesn't need to grapple with. Uh, that's one thing I can say for certain. You're fortunate not to be involved in it. Um, as I say, I've spent a lot of time talking to uh, a lot of local authorities um, and standard employers and LGFA, and I think I I know as much about this as anybody. Uh, it's quite a um, as I'm very happy to have a, a, another conversation about this. If anyone's interested in, um, I could spend a lot of time talking about it, but I think you'd find it of interest. So it's, that's a standard standing offer. Just a question for me: the the uh, variance in in the in how the banks are reacting, the variability. Have you got a, a, an idea of why that is? Is it is it is it a global connection um, that they are seeing that? Uh, you mean why they come out with such big, ah, uh, ah, uh, well, what, what, <laughs> I'm sort of thinking about how to politically say this, but um, I think some economists see themselves as kind of rock stars these days. So I think sound bites are kind of in some respects is what they're after, um, which I think doesn't do them any favors. Um, but look, everyone's entitled to their view. Um, Given the economic data, would they come out recently as well? So, Mackenzie, well, just just on that uh, grant, uh, there was a very good interview with the ASB economist and the Westpac economist on that very issue this morning on Radio New Zealand. So, if you go back through the, you can get that replayed. You can, it's worth listening to. They didn't mention the rock star word, did they? No, <laughs> okay, so. If there, no, if there are no more questions, um, if there are no more questions, and, um, and like, uh, thank, thanks very much uh, for pre presenting um, David and Brian. I'll put the motion that the Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the report from Bangkok Treasury Services to the 31st December 2023. Do we have a mover? Councillor Southworth, seconder. Councillor McKenzie. Any further discussion? Graham? If I may suggest an amendment of a fund, I hope I believe it's important that we, this committee, note that we are in compliance with the policies and covenants and are not forecasting to be going outside those bands. Is that is that correct, Brian? Are you happy? Um, just Councillor Southworth, Councillor McKenzie, are you happy with that addition? Okay, thank you. No for, So all, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? No, carried. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Now I'll move to item 8.3, financial reserves and bike lines already at the table. Um, Brian. If you could introduce the report, thank you. Um, fundamentally, um, the report seeks to do two things. One is to update 
um, the committee on the current state or most recently audited state of the reserves against policy target and to present the revised um, policy for um, referral to council for approval. Um, I, I suppose in terms of explaining what the reserves are, the easiest way to think of them is like a bank account. Um, they basically summarize the ins and outs, the transactions, positive and minus, um, related to certain specific activities, for example, forestry or emergency management response, etc. So what you'll find is some of them are in the positive, which means that over a period of time, they have accumulated often rates, um, quite often through targeted rates, for example, um, which have not been spent as such. So they have been put aside as a positive balance in those um, reserves. Um, you'll also see there are some substantial um, negative balances in, at the 30th of June. Um, those represent areas where we have actively borrowed in order to do some activity, for example, um, property development reserve represents the borrowing on Kayanga and this building. So what we're trying to say by showing that negative balance is that yes, you might have had some positive years, but you, you've actually committed to a lot of outgoings over the next few years. So if you were to say, let's draw on the property development reserve, it's actually overcommitted for the next several years. So unless you put more income basically back into it faster in order to basically balance out that loan, um, there is no spare money in that account in order to do further property development work. So although the um, although it can be argued that those loans are a separate um, item, what they're trying to what we're trying to show with that um, table is really that for those specific activities, you're already forward committed substantially in terms of outgoings, which you haven't currently got incoming to balance against. So uh, that's kind of a, a potted version of it at this point. Um, on page 39, um, you'll notice there in the um, reserves policy that there is a um, list of the reasons you might want to keep the reserves positive. Um, fundamentally, where we keep committing to doing stuff by loan debt, um, we are further extending the debt, weakening our overall ability to respond to a major event which might occur. And so to some extent, that's what the overall um, reserve position is telling us, is that our ability to um, serve up cash to respond to a, a sudden event is very, very limited at this time. Um, and so, while individual ones uh, are positive and others are negative, um, it may be going forward something that council wants to consider in terms of what is a comfortable level of reserve, which overall they would like to sit with. Um, as Giles has, has intimated previously, something we intend to look at at least in the 24-25 year going forward. Any questions? Questions? Councillor McKenzie. Yeah, and no, I've quite got the chair on my mind yet, but uh, we'll have a crack. So uh, you mentioned uh, the property development reserve as being in deficit, and that we, but that was because we committed the, but we borrowed to fund property development clearly, but you said we haven't made provision for that in. It really represents, as of today or at the 30th of June, what the state of the play is. We have a big commitment, but there's not a lot of cash to offset it, basically. But over time, yes, over 10 years, we would have rated to pay that off. So you'll find effectively the reserve will be slowly replenished over those 10 years. But if something bad happened today, you've got no money. So what is the amount of rate that we're collecting for? I mean, that, yeah, so we, we are, we're funding the debt yeah. already. Yeah, yeah, okay. So if you take out the property development reserve, which is in deficit by $14 million, and the YMAC flood 
projection project, which is $20 million in de deficit. And so they're clearly borrowed for and are being funded, completely funded. In terms of yeah, those projects under risk by not having healthier reserve balances there when the, I mean, if, if, if the policy target is zero, in other words, no debt, we would have to rate the Waimak district, the Waimak River rating scheme, $20 million in what, one year to get that position back to neutral, which would mean that we could pay off the loan in 12 months instead of 50 years or whatever it's financed over. So I guess what I'm, what I'm questioning is really is, for the, those two items in particular, is the, are the policy targets screwing the scrum here a little bit on where we need to set our reserves policy? I, I get it for the general operations contingent reserve, and I certainly get it for the river rating uh, flood protection reserves because they are ongoing risks on a daily basis. Financing finance risk for a project. Are they are we conflating two different levels of risk in terms of our reserve? Okay, we'll looking at the property development reserve. But if something happened today, we had to suddenly build another building. We've got no cash to be able to do it with, so we would have to go to the market to borrow again. And at some point, we would reach our headroom for borrowing as well. So it's those are the risks that it's trying to flag to you, and, and you must balance. Keep going, Mr. Chairman. Because uh, uh, I just I just need to. So I mean, and the trouble is, we're talking about all these different funds, and they've all got different answers. So. So in terms of property development reserve, did that used to have a zero balance? Have, have we gone to a, in a position as a council from zero balance meeting our policy target to a 20, uh, 15, 14 million dollar debt without, and so have we robbed the bank and not replenished the bank? Yeah, the property development reserve, for example, is purely around the debt for Kayanga and this building. So prior to this building, it would have been zero. But we don't need to run a zero policy no, if, as long as the debt is funded. Yeah, it just reflects. Right. And in terms of the WIMAC flood projection project, that the, the WIMAC is, in terms of maintenance, is fully funded. And so the risk would be to this organisation is if we had the debt but didn't have enough sufficient rates to maintain the asset that the debt is sitting against. Is that fair? And therefore, as long as we're funding, adequately funding the maintenance of the asset, there shouldn't be a risk to this organisation in the debt that's sitting there. Is that fair? What it's what is really saying in regards to the WAMAC is you're already at, at 30th, 30th of June, 21 million committed already. So if all the uh, WIMAC stock banks are destroyed in a in a event, then you will be incurring more debt on top of that. There isn't a pool of money sitting available to suddenly rebuild. So, so the risk, so I kind of assess then the risk of our reserves policy in terms of WIMAC in particular, as long as we're making sure that the project that the, the scheme is adequately funded to make sure that we maintain it as design capacity, which is a one in five hundred year flood which would tend to suggest the risk of it failing is relatively low, then the risk of not following, following our policy target is a, is a risk we could probably accept from the council perspective. Okay, so then when we, if we can just get then onto the general rates, because that's clearly the other major area of deficit, and we're funding that at two and a half million, to two point four million dollars a year to replenish those rates. In which case, it's going to take four, four years, or four years, four years to get there. Is that is that putting us? What what's the level of risk then to this organisation in in taking four years to get there rather than a shorter time? Um, in terms of the general reserve. That is actually also covering debt as well on the, um, the flood recovery, so which we put in place um, a couple of years ago. So there is the same argument about 
bad had happened to the organization and we wanted to spend those general reserves there aren't any because we're already going to be paying them out on that debt so it would be just going straight to all rates etc cetera, etc cetera. last question mr chairman with your, your indulgence so is your advice that the 2.4 million dollars we're using to replenish that general rate sufficient or is it insufficient It really amounts to what you believe the risk attached to some of these events. Okay. Um, in terms of the policy, it's sufficient. Uh, whether we should revisit the size of that reserve um, and significantly increase it given the risks that we may imagine might occur, um, that's part of the work yet to be done. Um, Councillor Robinson. Thanks for that. Um, just with regards to on page 35, with regards to the emergency management response um, and kind of relation to the, the general reserves as well, um, when it comes down to a response, say, such as um, an oil spill or similar, like a large scale um, environmental impact. Uh, where does that um, funds come from? Is it in some sort of uh, emergency management response or does it? I know sometimes it's recovered, but it takes time. So in the meantime, it's. Yeah, it, that's essentially a description of that reserve. That's what it's for is if we are unable to recover the, the additional costs. We have leeway to that amount of money to go into deficit for those purposes. Jockey, I'll just add to that from a <clears throat> civil defence and Councillor Sunkel might, might wish to add to this. Um, a lot of conversations at the Joint Committee about the level of reserves that's appropriate for CDM to keep. I think uh, there was a debate some time ago or a number of years ago about whether they should have a larger reserve, recognising their um, unique circumstances within the council or whether they should have access to their own borrowing facilities. I think the view was taken, uh, which I support by my predecessor, is that, that given the size of environment Canterbury, um, that should an event happen, we have access to sufficient cash in terms of borrowing um, uh, with immediate effect to support any immediate recovery, um, recognising that clearly recovery and re reclamation. I actually think that's a really good idea, considering everything's getting bigger and worse for events such as you just mentioned. Um, yeah, I support that too. And how do we move on from that? How do we put that on the agenda to rediscuss that? I think it's the, the policy, so it sits within the Canterbury Group. So yes, we would like to have that reserve probably a wee bit bigger, but I think the balance is that allows our controllers to get on and do stuff. So they don't have to think about picking up the phone, asking for borrowing capacity. And yes, we can put things in place within 36 or 48 hours, but that's not really the place that we want our, our response people thinking about. So it gives us the ability to get up and go and then worry about the, the subsequent funding as we go on. And a million and a half or something of funding probably gets us a few days in, depending on, on what we're doing. If we think 1.6 million for the helicopters just within the Port Hills fire. So it's an ability to get up, go, and then worry about the funding. And we have always said, and Canterbury Group accepts, that we have the borrowing capacity to then further fund as required that would then be paid back or whatever. Cheers, Scott. Yeah, um, so my, mine's, mine's um, some questions re regarding uh, uh, audited reserves 2023, 22-23 annual report um, and looking at those balances at the end of each of those lines um, and looking at the balance at 8.9 million at, at June 23 and then the target policy for 2024, which we're getting through pretty quick at the moment, uh, 2024 is 51. So it's about 17% of what that target is. So to, to me, that's like, oh, where will the money go? Um, what are we going to do about that? So that's a question I have. Um, so this is a commentary more than questions, but I, I just... I just that, that me. Yeah, it's um, a 
point number to learn the test because I've got to uh, the council hold no less than 60% of the minimum level of cash flow and emergency reserves, and I get that by 100% over there. And then the next bit, the overall target with reserve level is currently considering each contingent in isolation and aggregating the amount. So my question really is, A, do we need all those categories? That's my question. Um, and also, if you're a council looking at this without a lot, not a lot of uh, interest in this area, and you saw those numbers at 17 weeks, it would be a percentage to guide people in terms of where risk is. So, those are my base questions, I guess, in terms of this um, stuff. Um, you know, uh, we're going through an LTP process at the moment, and we should be concerned about reserves, absolutely. Um, we're going to be on a knife edge in terms of what we're going to consider rating. Uh, the contingency, <coughs> excuse me, for reserves is really, really important and it's been stressed time and time again while well, I've been here anyway. So I, I just think that we need to note that. We need to note that when we're going forward that this type of, these types of numbers sort of worry me a wee bit. So uh, thanks, Chair Scott. <laughs> the, when we were preparing this paper, um, it became apparent to, to myself and Brian that we need to do some further work in this space to um, a think of a you know to review whether these are the right reserves and whether we can consolidate, remove, but probably more importantly whether we can present them in a way that tells a story more clearly. Uh, we didn't have time to do that in time for this paper, but we certainly intend to do that early in 24-25. And our intention is to then review the target levels every year around the annual plan process so that we're using current information. To it, I'm hesitating from using the example because council debt, national debt, and personal debt are, are different things. However, to illustrate the point, if you have a mortgage, you separate your mortgage debt and whether you're and whether you're comfortable with that from your current account living. And your flat, your ability to meet ups and downs in your weekly or monthly expenditure. What we have here in the way that this is presented in the passenger transport uh, area. Um, so that's exactly why we want to come back and do some further work in this space. But we thought it was important, given that we had, we do need to re review the target levels. The policy did need updating. That it was that we brought this paper to surface this issue so that we can continue that conversation with council through this committee around what is the appropriate level of reserves and how do we over time. Because what you'll see in the policy is that whilst, you know, we may or may not think that the levels of reserves are appropriate, um, we've had several discussions with council about, about them, about those. The policy is clear that building those reserves needs to be in the context of the economic environment, the impact that that has on ratepayers and the risk that the council is prepared to take, because we do have borrowing headroom. Just a further comment, Grant, if you don't mind. Um, so we're not a fair weather situation at the moment, and reserves will be important to us. And I just, um, I'll, I'll reach back into time, and when the earthquake occurred, we had magnificent transport reserves, public transport reserves, which meant that public transport system could be put, stood up, if you like, um, very, very quickly. Once uh, you know, once the uh, the roading stuff got sorted out, and that was a big saviour for a lot of people who lost vehicles and the ability to get around. <clears throat> we need those in flood. We need those in those instances there where something comes along in our background that's going to kick our backsides. And I just that concerns me that it needs to be front of mind rather than back of mind. Yeah, Graham McGlynn. These reserves really reflect the fact that we do periodically have non-business as usual events like typically floods, whatever, the things that happen might be buying building that it's not normal. But we're rating um, based on normal years and we've got to build into those rates uh, effectively the smoothing for the peaks and troughs. So it really comes down to what the risk is of, for instance, the YMAC having that one in 500 year risk um, becoming an issue uh, in the close proximity to now. 
and um, suddenly while well, we had Rakata, was it Rangatata went a couple of three years ago, and suddenly there was a, a batch of expenditure to resurrect the stock banks and things, and uh, so that it's it's making sure we are over an extended period of time matching the income that we're getting to the expenditure that we're likely to have. So that tries to put it relatively simply. Yeah, I just uh, completely agree with you, um, Graham, uh, and support what you've said. I, just, I think the, uh, and uh, Councilman McKenzie talks about it, the flood uh, flood uh, protection reserves, interesting is, is the WIMAX being pulled out because it has such an overbearing impact on the other reserves. If you aggregated those across and we just had a single flood protection reserve, it would in a sense be saying we have no money for any flood protection uh, event across the whole region. What we're saying by pulling out WIMAC is to say, well, WIMAC has spent a lot of money on for very good reasons. The rest of the reason, region currently has $11 million. So it is about what's the story we want to tell, what's the advantages of aggregating, and what's the advantages of having lots and lots of small reserves. That's a conversation Brian and I want to come back to this committee in the first instance with. And, and um, just looking, Brian, at page 53, the appendix policy reserves funds, that's pretty much um, the current policy settings. Uh, as opposed, is that, am I right? As opposed to the audited reserves position. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if it would be useful, uh, if it's okay with you, Peter, the questions that you raise are noted in the minutes, perhaps. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And just a question. So, if we if we um, accept the recommendation that we adopt the revised reserves policy, attached from eight point three one, that includes the new the Policy targets, as as listed in page thirty six, or then goes through that table in pages forty uh, under appendix one, does it? Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah. And so, therefore, for the those two items where the money's been borrowed, but there's no, you know, so you've got the borrowed amount, twenty two million for WIMAC and zero balance. What are, what are the implications of that if this reserves policy? Do we then have to rate to uh, Restore that to a zero balance faster than the rate of the loan repayment. No, no, because no, I mean I think as we've already covered, I mean in effect the reason that that's been pulled out is because we have such a large debt. So actually we want to get rid of that. Um, all other things being equal, so I think we've returned to having. Um, um, we are already rating to repay that debt. It's included in our debt repayment, as we talked about to. Uh, this committee some time ago, we've now aggregated all of our debt and we charge all of pro individual projects on a basket rather than targeting individual components of rates uh, of, of debt. So if you the previous presentation from from Bancorp, our average cost of debt is 4.1%. So we're charging everything and that's all built into the LTP calculations. And over time, that debt will be repaid. So if, if by passing this recommendation, we're not going to um, aim for all those policy targets. Shouldn't those those reserves would not not be part of the policy? Policy target. We need to have policy targets. The the policy statement targets are associated. We need to review them uh, on a on a regular basis. I think it plays into the reason why that recommendation is there. Is we need to do some further work to come back and go. If you've got a target, what's the time period at which you're going to um, uh, move to achieve that? How does that relate to your risk appetite in the context of the economic uh, environment? And what does that mean in the context of the impact on ratepayers? Policy is very clear, as I said earlier, that yes, you should be looking to achieve those target uh, balances, all other things being equal, but it's not the only thing you should take into account. Okay, this, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put the motion. Sorry, just. Um... In terms of um, the longer term risks, 
because this is going to be evolving, isn't it? Because we've got climate change and the current, you know, what we're thinking is the one in 500 will be. And that's been flagged in the Office of the Auditor General's report, as has a peer review of our infrastructure strategy. So it seems like this is a really key question and those things all sort of fit together. And so, you know, are we, are we confident we've got the, you know, we can sign this now, I think, but really need to make sure we've got a clear plan of how to sort of integrate all those different aspects to have that understanding and of the risk and of the growing risks and how we're offsetting them. <laughs> Because that one in five hundred question—that's that's a that's a moving goalpost now. What we have here, and obviously what we have in the consultation document, um, which will be discussed at council next week, um, is the current understanding and current view at a point in time. It's an evolving conversation, um, as uh, we, as an executive team, and Stephanie uh, have talked to council on a number of occasions. Is we believe this is an ongoing journey and our understanding and our response to that needs to evolve and develop over time. So we need to have further conversations around what is the appropriate areas this council should be investing in? What are the levels of investment it should be making? Uh, what is the risk appetite? Uh, how do we respond? Should our assumptions not come to pass? So all of that is an ongoing conversation. We're recommending adoption of this policy or asking you to recommend adoption to council uh, and the target levels based on the information we have at this point in time. Are they right? No. Are they better than they were? Yes. Thank, thank you. Well, the upshot of this is really got further work to do on it and um, investigating the reserves, um, the rationale, and then bringing in those things that you suggested that are on the books and that we're forward thinking. Um, I'll, I'll put this, these motions that the, and the, they're on page 34, that the Audit Finance and Risk Committee notes the update on the current state of Council's reserves, notes the importance of maintaining Council reserves at the appropriate level, notes that a review of the number and types of reserves maintained by the Council will be undertaken in the 2024-25 year and recommends to the Canterbury Regional Council that they adopt the revised reserves policy dated the February 2024 as attachment 8.3.1. Do I have a mover? Councillor Mackenzie seconded. Councillor Sunkel, any further discussion? None. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Oh, carried. Thank you. I'll move to item 8.4. Financial health report and forecast. And Brian's going to speak to that as well. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> okay. Um, the financial report um, this time has been broken into two elements. Two areas of interest um, within the current report is that the um, emission trading scheme. Uh, price in the market has turned around and we are at the moment staring down a barrel of a gain of $67 million for the year potentially for our ETS portfolio. Um, a question was raised about the impact of the fires out in WIMAC um, and it is estimated the impact is about. Um, a second item is of course the risk pool civic insurance scheme which is um, making calls against the members of the scheme. Um, I checked with them again last week and there's been no further movement on that issue. Um, they're still waiting on the other councils who are making claims to decide if they will withdraw or not. So that has not yet happened. Um, and once they make that decision, if they're going to continue, then it will be over to the reinsurers to see how much participation they're prepared to take into the whole um, liability. So at this stage, it's it's still outstanding there at the moment. Um, beyond that, um, you'll find in the following quarterly report that um, the finances are looking relatively rosy. And in fact, and the bullet point on um, 
page 62, um, number four, does pretty much show that we're still in surplus. But in actual fact, compared to even our three plus nine forecast, we are running below the surplus we had expected. Um, where we're um, finding that is fundamentally there are a number of things going on, obviously, um, within the organisation and the environment generally. Um, we're obviously seeing cost pressures coming through in terms of uh, the general economic environment, interest rates, um, inflation is staying stickier longer. Um, the um, political environment has clearly changed, and that is expected to have some impact for the end of the year in terms of costs and new programs, etc. Um, and we are finding that there are some of the um, the raising the bar programs, such as the uh, sustainable consents program, that are actually finding as they proceed and develop that the costs of um, improving their service quality is uh, proving to be higher than expected. Um, we are working hard with all those people to make sure that we still come in on budget, but there are a lot of pressures at this time and still a number of unknowns in the envi wider environment. So at this time, we're ex our forecast um, based on the um, December half year is um, that we will come in on budget. Um, we had previously had a small uh, cost pressures pool to offset some of these additional pressures, and we have now found that that is pretty much all absorbed. So it will very much be a management um, task to bring us home by the 30th of June on budget. So, yeah, that's the summary. Brian, uh, Graham? Page 63, I think it is, um, debt is paragraph six. <clears throat> you mentioned there that uh, you've got two key debtors, and please don't break any commercial by putting names out there or anything, um, but two key debtors, what, were, what was the total of those two, and you indicate received in January, February 24, have they been received and any risks? Um, it would be fair to say both debtors are government agencies, <laughs> and um, yes, they have cleared their debt since um, that time. Seven million. Seven million. Seven million. Yes. Chief, Chief Scott. Oh, yeah. sorry, Councillor McKenzie. Just, I just wonder, and it may not be a, ever be appropriate in a paper like this to put commentary on that, but whether some visibility in public exclude or whatever could be given to those things. I mean, councillors, um, as alluded to by uh, Graham McGlynn, uh, he doesn't want names, but it's always handy to know where that risk sits. Uh, if it's a central government, then well, what's the risk there? Um, who knows? I'm just wondering. I mean, that's my my commentary rather than my question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my question goes back to the forestry assets, not only uh, the ETS valuations, but also the forestry assets themselves. Uh, given the given that much, of it, well, as I understand it, a fair number of our forestry assets are associated with our rivers, and therefore recreational activity alongside our forestry assets and therefore the exposure to fire and, the, and therefore the loss of value in terms of not only forestry assets but also the ETS for our assets. Um, a, are the valuations in our, on our balance sheet, do they take into account that risk? And, probably, and the answer to that is probably not. But then the other side of that is, are we doing stuff to mitigate the risk by closing our forests to public access or uh, putting in fire breaks to minimise the amount of loss that could happen in any one event or wh whatever else to, to protect the value of those ETS assets and the forestry assets in the first place. In terms of the first question, um, in, in terms of the ETS values, they're based purely on market value. So you could assume that the market um, builds in an element of risk for fire and damage, um, but that's basically just how we use it. 
Um, in terms of the valuation of the forests themselves, yes, the valuers do use a um, discount factor for risk around those issues. So, at, like, um, like the last part, which was, are we doing anything to manage our forests in a way to minimise the fire risk? And what I would su what I would suggest is that if we we uh, I mean as I as I mentioned earlier, um, there is a briefing on forests and our land plan for council, and that we can ask uh, Stephen to include reference to that, or the question could be raised as part of that session. Jim, just again, um, uh, probably lack of my reading on this, but. Um, my interest in that uh, insurance uh, cover through risk pool, Civic, um, is that I'm not too sure how widely known that is. I knew, I knew about it for a while, but um, is there an opportunity somewhere, Joel, to get an update? On that? Um, essentially, that's what we've tried to, to represent here is the current position. Um, as I said, well, I've checked back with Riscall and there is no further information at this time. Uh, so we have uh, gone back and asked them the questions on a couple of occasions, um, as we've indicated. The claims that would result in that kind of liability, we, you know, they are, they believe they will not proceed given their, the timing of them. They're out of time. Um, so whilst we presented that picture, our current estimate is that there's a low probability of that, uh, of that um, coming to pass and impacting on the council's finances. And if we get any further information, we'll clearly provide it. And I note, I note that the membership is, uh, is you, you can't trade your way out of that membership. So you know whether it's a drop dead opportunity or, or you know, we, you know what? For me, in my mind, it's 125k and 2.5 is the risk. So you know what's the what's what's the membership cost? Um, are we better in or out? I mean, insurance is going to be pretty interesting for us. So this relates to when we were a member. And so it's relating to the years that we were a member for, and that that until the scheme is wound up, which is proceeding, we continue with that risk until it's closed, and that is proceeding. Well, the intention is that it will be wound up and closed, assuming those claims don't proceed within the next 12 months. Councillor Robinson. Um, I've just got a question about debtors as well, with regards to the one hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars that is past ninety days due for the harbors. Um, is that in relation to the recent incident um, of last year, September? No, that tends to be um, a hangover of swing mooring charges, and traditionally they're extremely slow payers, and so it builds up over time. How far over 90 days is it on average? <clears throat> um, I, I can't say exactly, but it is quite a while. Um, and we are chipping away at collection, but there is a large number of them of small value. Yeah. Charles, would you like to call? Yeah, I just want to um, give some assurance to Council and, and suggest that we include a bit more information in the May report. Um, the story around debtors is actually an extremely good one over the last couple of years um, in terms of the size and um, time profile of our outstanding debt. Uh, Brian and his team have done a lot of work in this space to reduce the amount of debt and to reduce the time. So uh, we have a pretty good story to tell, I think. Well, we're never going to not have a debt book. And so I think uh, we next uh, at the next meeting we should perhaps include a couple of those graphs that we've produced in the past to show how it's changed over the last couple of years to give the council some assurance. 
just to reiterate that point over time, uh, the predecessor to you, there was a significant effort in bringing those those numbers down and that those graphs really do show where we land and it's kind of almost a residual space where it bumps around. But uh, you always want better, but I think we're in a, in a particularly good place in comparison to where we might have been six, seven, eight years ago. Graham McGlynn. Just to confirm, those debtors are the non rates debtors, aren't they? The rates debtors are. Correct, yes. They're, they're actually charges that we issue. There be no more questions. I'll put the motion. That the Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the financial health report for the period ending 31st December 2023. Do I have a mover? Councillor Robinson, second Councillor Sunkel. Any further discussion? None. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? None. Carried. Thank you. Um, we are running behind. Um, and we're now moving on to item 8.5, the quarterly performance report, um, on page 66. I invite Carmen and um, I was wondering if we could take the report as being read and for people to just go straight into questions, if that's okay with councillors. Okay, thanks, Carmen. So, any questions? to Carmen on this paper. Councillor Southworth. Yeah, thank you. So on um, page 94. Yeah, we're on 8.5, aren't we? Yes. Mm -hmm. So page such a big one, it's difficult to know. <laughs> so it's page 94 at the bottom, we've got PT safety enhancement investigation. And I'm just sorry, it says that um, we're waiting resources to commence the procurement of safety officers. And I thought that we had approved the resources. So I'm wondering by resources, does it mean the funding or does it mean something else, like not enough staff? And so there's a there's a gap. What's the issue with that? Uh, so I think Giles will answer this one. <laughs> uh, so the issue has been recruiting a member of staff to oversee the procurement um, exercise and to lead that initiative. So that is now in place and the procurement is proceeding. Any other questions? Councillor Sunkel. Just a question, given that we're not going through the report, are there any matters that you would consider significant in those matters that will not be achieved or have the potential not to be achieved within the report? I, I think the only um, key matter is around the consenting, which has been um, referred to uh, with the level of service. Uh, that we're monitoring and the, the initiative work around that, and then obviously the financial impact that Brian's already spoken to. So. Thank you. I guess given our previous discussions, we've gone from a risk to an issue that, that we're dealing with, but it's noted. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, John. Um, not really a question for me, just page 96, the Greater Christchurch Spatial Plan, just confirming that the uh, Greater Christchurch Partnership uh, has uh, endorsed the plan for um, further consideration by the partner councils. Okay. Page 87, um, number 22. Um, and that's the partnering with Naitohu City and District Councils. So with this one, um, because I know that it's come up quite a number of times at Aukatuya, um, and particularly um, one particular Papatipa Runanga, which is Rapaki. Um, and so is this a, um, a Naitahu based one, or is it actually a combination of um, the city and district councils? I think I have to pass to either Dave or Tim to answer that one. It's, uh, I 
Sorry, my question really is, is that uh, there is a delay. But the question is that um, looking at this as being a delay, so we're, we're, we're not going to deliver a coastal plan on, on this time frame. Is that, is that correct? That's correct within this financial year. And um, the That's part of our overall integrated planning framework, and so with the uh, that's been prioritised. Um, this is the one level of service uh, that won't be achieved within this financial year that relates to that planning work. If I could add to that, um, it is part of the integrated planning. So when the long-term plan was set and this levels of service was there, we hadn't settled the governance arrangements. And so now we know where we're going. So that is a level of service that we won't meet because we've changed the way we're progressing the coastal plan. As in partnership with the and through the two-year partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. I mean, it's it's very clear that. Oh, that's what's out Sorry. Um, on page hundred and one, we've got um, monitoring priority consents at risk. They didn't, it wasn't achieved in 22-23 and we're at risk. Thoughts about high staff turnover and um, that we, we're training new, newly recruited staff to try and address the shortage. And, but what are we doing to address the turnover? Because we can retrain, but we continue, we continue along the same pattern. So have we done something differently to get more retention? Retention of those new staff. Uh, no, it's it's the consenting one. So I I think that I'm not particularly close to this work, but that the turnover of system staff isn't such an issue anymore. But it's the the new amount of new staff coming through now that will require time to be trained up and be fully. Um, up to speed to, to turn this around, so that's why we're continuing to show this as being at risk. So we have confidence that the newly trained staff we are able to we're likely to be able to retain, and that the issues that have caused the lack of retention previously is, are now resolved. And, and could we just add? So the the whole report comes to AFRC for an assurance piece, but each of these portfolios will come. So on the 13th of March, this report will come to the Water and Land Committee, and so I think there'll be oh, well, it goes to regional leadership. So there will be an opportunity within that committee to ask some more detailed questions, and the right staff will be in the room for that. So I think that's probably the best way that we can deal with that in terms of the detail you're looking for. Thanks, Carmen. I mean, really looking at page 67 with the summary chart there uh, of the 40 levels of service, uh, two are not going to be achieved. It's a pretty good effort given the circumstances that we're in now. Um, and and uh, we know that those that can't be achieved, we know where we're going with those and what we've got to do to resolve, resolve those. So it's pretty good. So, um, one order, thank you very much for, for presenting. Finance and Risk Committee 1 receives the Organisational Performance Report for Quarter 2, 23-24, notes the status of the non-financial levels of service and key initiatives and financial performance and results for Quarter 2, 23-24, period ending the 31st December 2023, and notes the key issues identified in the report impacting the non-financial and financial performance for Quarter 2, and the actions being implemented to address these. Do I have a mover? Chair Scott, Councillor, Councillor Robinson. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? No, carried. Thank you. I'll move to item April 6. Annual report. And welcome Yvonne Young from uh, Order New Zealand. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, this report is about the 
in your audit FY 2023. Um, we didn't get um, um, getting to the one November um, ARC meet, AFRC meeting, so we present here. Um, I took this report as a read. Um, the only thing I want to highlight is the recommendations in under the section 6.1 on, on your page 123. Um, considering the incident in relation to the procurement process, we will involve our procurement and contractor management specialists to review whether and how the council has made effective progress to ensure such incidents do not occur in the future. And then we're required to report back to OAG after our review during um, in the next couple months time when we get into the um, 2024 annual, annual audit interim visit. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions in relation to this report. Any questions? No questions. Thank you, Bob. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the report is um, issued as an unmodified report um, and, and that you've expressed satisfaction that um, the council's activities for the year and financial position for the year have uh, been in good order. Um, so that's so that's really good. And I'm I'm sure in terms of the recommendations that you make, uh, some of these I know are sort of being addressed. Part of the raising of the bar issue too, uh, particularly on page 127, where it gives a bit of a description of um, you know some of the things that we need to do, um, and you've given some good advice. Um, you've also commented on the previous recommendations, the status of 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 those previous recommendations, and the work that's either still ongoing or has been completed. Um, so that's that's great. Um, well, that being no further questions, I'll put this motion that the Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the Audit New Zealand Report to Council on the annual report for the year ended 30th of June 2023 and notes the recommendations and management responses, which will be monitored as part of the committee's outstanding actions and followed up by Audit New Zealand as part of the 23-24 audit. So I have a mover, Councillor Sunkel, seconder, Graham McGlynn. Any further questions, um, discussion? No further discussion. Oh, Councillor Sunkel. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I think it's always pleasing to, uh, to have an unmodified report come through. I know there's a lot of work that goes into some of the conversations and clarifications uh, to reach a point. Um, but again, uh, really pleasing to to note that, that staff and processes are, are in place uh, to get us to a point where, yes, there's bits and pieces to tidy up. But and all, um, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, none against, carried. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yvonne. And if you if you could, you could stay at the table, Yvonne, sorry. Because <laughs> you're on next. to us. Yeah, um, sorry, I have to table this report. So um, I assume everyone has a copy handy. Um, so I will take you through the report um, on high level quickly. So if, um, if I may turn on to the page three. Overall, we concluded that the Council's consultation document met its primary purpose of providing an effective basis for public participants in, this, in decision making on the content of the long term plan. The consulting document in, included all the major matters that we had expected, including the preferred and alternative options to address those major matters. We intend to issue a mod unmodified of the report on 28th of February next Wednesday. Without modifying our op opinion, we will include an emphasis of matter paragraph in relation to the uncertainty 
over a ZTA funding, which I will talk about it at the, the, at the later page. Um, if we move on to the page five, we set out a few significant issues in our audit response and corresponding conclusion. The first one is the proposed rate rates increase. The council's preferred option has an average of 24.2% increase. It was noted that the rates increase in year one and year two have exceeded the set quantified limit on rates increase of 10% a year. The, six, the second item is the climate change on the next page, page six. We have assessed in the risk we have assessed the reasonableness of the Council's climate change assumption and its application on the financial and the service performance forecast. In particular, we are comfortable with the Council's climate change assumption affecting on its flood protection assets and corresponding adoption costs in its infrastructure strategy. The cost estimated for the significant projects such as PD Futures in response to Council's emission reduction and climate change initiatives. The next item is a healthy waterway. Our review, our review has highlighted that the Council intends to borrow a additional 110.7 million debt over the lifetime of the long-term plan period to facilitate the, um, the regulatory framework with principal loan payments amounting to 78 million through to the end of the 10 year plan. This borrowing is estimated to incur interest expenditure of 28 million. We are satisfied that appropriate disclosure has been added subsequently to the consultation document. Um, therefore, no implication on all report or emphasis of matter paragraph as such. The next item on the page seven is related to NCTA funding. As part of the VT Futures Initiative, the Council plans to enhance certain routes as outlined in, outlined in the consultation document. The proposed improvements costing 142.3 million over the 10 years time will be co-funded by NCTA with additional support from the rates. We are satisfied that the business case is reasonable and supported and supportable. We propose a emphasis of meta paragraph included in the audio opinion. The paragraph will draw readers' attention to the high level of uncertainty over NZTA expected funding for the PT future programs due to um, NZTA has not confirmed the funding yet. Um, if NCTA does not provide the funding or provides less funding than assumed, the PD Future Program will either not proceed or will be reconsidered depending on the level of funding received. Um, page nine, we given um, the council forecast a deficit of 10.3 million for the year 2025. Sorry, I'm talking about the item um, 3.2. We remind the council to pass a resolution to clearly outline that it is financially prudent to have a unbalanced budget on or prior to the adoption of long-term plan in accordance with Local Government Act Section 102. And the page 10, um, the recommendation section to 3.3, the financial model which fit into the draft long-term plan is divided by into two parts, the budgeting process in TM1 and the production of the financial statements through the BRI system. Therefore, we have reviewed both systems and have identified the number of recommendations that we believe will help to enhance the council's executing and reviewing the financial model. Additionally, these recommendations will also contribute to a more efficient and effective audit process going forward. 
page 11, section 3.4, um, outlined that we are satisfied that the infrastructure strategy serves its intended purpose. However, we have identified a number of recommendations to further improve this infrastructure strategy to align it with the best practice. Um, yeah, a few pages um, are the uh, appendix about the corrective recommendations and the details of the improvement that can be made to the budgeting and financial reporting process. Um, I think that's all I want to report to highlight here in relation to the long term plan CD audit. Um, following the consultation, period and council's hearing of submission, we will review the final stage uh, of the long-term plan um, and issue a separate order report on the final long-term plan. I just want to remind um, the management on page 12 that uh, to prepare and provide us with a schedule of changes to the financial forecast and other underlying information that will the basis for the consultation document um, to ensure the audit of the final long-term plan will be efficient. Um, happy to take any questions. And I just, uh, would you like to talk first? No, just pass it on. No. Just get Giles to uh, talk first. So I just want to acknowledge uh, the work that Yvonne and her team and also um, the rest of your, uh, our organisation has done in, in, in undertaking the audit. Um, I just wanted to highlight that obviously we provided management responses to each of the recommendations, which um, I think show a positive response to the recommendations made. The one issue I do want to highlight for council um, or for this committee is that uh, when we talked uh, about putting the consultation document together and about the annual rate increase limit benchmark target that we were going to set, we talked about having a average rolling over 10 years of 10% in discussion with Yvonne and her team. Um, it's very clear that the legislation requires us to set an annual target. So we have uh, used the 10% on an annual basis. And that's why the point is made that we are actually exceeding that in the first two years. Um, hopefully people around the table will recall those conversations about given the rate increase that we were proposing for the first two years, setting a limit lower than that would be challenging and that's why we were talking about an average um, and so that's reflected in the consultation document um, and obviously will part of what is adopted next week for consultation. Council. Page 9, th uh, achieving a balanced budget 3.2. If we don't pass a resolution stating it is financially prudent to run an unbalanced budget, what happens? If we don't, under section 100, part two of the Local Government Act, the local authority is required to pass a, pass a resolution stating it is financially prudent to forecast an unbalanced budget. If we put forward an unbalanced budget but don't pass that resolution, what happens? That's a good question. I need to consult OAG legal team and come back to you. Um, it will be a breach of local government act, um, but if that's going to happen, um, I will um, encourage the management. Let me know, and then I can let OAG know, and um, they will decide on the implication of all the reports for the long term plan. At this stage, for the consultation document stage, um, you are not required by law to have the resolution. Resolution, we've talked about this, the resolution will be before formal adoption of the long term plan in June. So after deliberations and council will recall that the reason that we have a deficit uh, budget in the first two years is the decision to um, implement the policy on a consistent basis, our financial policy of funding long term planning frameworks. We call it natural capital in the policy, maybe slightly misleading, but long term planning frameworks to smooth the cost of those over the 
benefit. So matching the OPEX expenditure with when the benefit falls, because the frameworks are in place for circa 10 years, um, rather than meeting on an annual cost. So that is the, that's the reason that the deficits are, are reflected. If we weren't borrowing 110 million over the 10 years, we would be having lumps of OPEX expenditure that we would need to rate for at periodic base, periodic places within that uh, 10 year period. Yeah, no, I get all the reasons, but uh, if we still, if the majority of the councillors still think it's imprudent to do that, it's not illegal, I'm, I'm hearing from here. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not something we have to resolve by next week. It's something that Yvonne and I will talk about before June so that you understand the implications and we have a uh, a way forward, hopefully, before the end of June. Yes, Scott. Uh, look, uh, Yvonne, thank you um, for bringing this up because I think it's something that councillors need to fully understand in terms of how we've got ourselves to where we are. And you're just pointing out the fact that this is here and we probably need to go back and revisit the reasoning why we got there. We made a prudent decision at the time where we got there. I mean, that, the, the problem that uh, audit has with us is there's no financial standard around uh, capital for OPEX, um, and there is no finan no so there's no asset backing for that. We've taken the view of that that the their planning documents are the basis of this organisation existing. Therefore, there is some asset value in that. So that's why we've got to there. But uh, capitalising OPEX is not something we want to do today, and this. Council has had long debates about that, especially in the last triennium. But I think this council needs to understand that and revisit that and understand where they're headed with that. And there's, there's another point with that is we need to have a plan how we get through this and how we repay this and not putting this burden on another council in the future. So we need to have a plan. I'd just like to remind, sorry, just, just like to remind those members of council who were here in the last triennium. And I wasn't when the LTP was passed. Uh, they adopted an LTP with deficits in the first two years. Um, I think our current LTP has a deficit in only the first year. But the council has previously adopted a long-term plan with deficits in the first two years. Any further questions? Councillor Sunkel? Just a comment and, and thank you for a, a really well um, set out document. Um, it flows through, it gives us notice of those matters that you have given consideration to and those matters that we should should think about. So it'd be a very clear, straightforward, and I appreciate the, the way that it was there. Thank you. Thanks, John. No, no further questions. And, and yes, thank, thanks very much for your commentary on the things that we need to do or the things that, we're, uh, that are uncertain uh, that might have implications for us uh, later especially public uh, transport futures program and the government's GPS, uh, which we're waiting on as well. Um, thanks, Yvonne. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll put this motion that the Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the audit report tabled by Audit New Zealand on Environment Canterbury's long-term plan 2024-34 to consultation document. Do I have a mover? Chair Scott, Graham McGlynn. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. Thank you very much. We're now going to move into PX so that we can attend to item 9.2.3. Um, and so uh, the people who may remain in the room, uh, so the resolution is that Wendy Pine, uh, Tanya Smits, uh, Stefan Theron, um, remain after the public have been excluded for the entire public excluded agenda and that Philip Moore and Lucy Delator from Wynne Williams be permitted to remain for the agenda item 9.2.3 uh, as they have the knowledge that is relevant to these items. I have a mover for that please. Councillor Robinson seconder. Graham McGlynn. All those in favour, please say aye. Yes, carried. So we'll just get staff to um, set things up for public excluded. Okay, well, um, we.
we're just uh, re-adjourning the uh, main meeting and picking up on 8.8 .8, health, safety and wellbeing update on page 137. And Wendy, I wonder if you could come to the table and report on this for us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chair. Um, given where we're at in the meeting, would you like to um, take the papers read and answer, ask questions and look for points of clarity? Does anyone have any questions on the on the paper? Councillor Southworth. I'm jumping between different bits of digital information. I'm struggling. Um, there was one I had around power lines and underground services. So we have had an incident in the past, and then I believe there's been an incident more recently. In our last meeting, we were advised we would get an update in terms of what we were going to do in response to the risk. That, but I couldn't see anything in our paper this time. So could you just give you an update and we can then circle back and include it in a written form in the next paper. Um, so we reported that there was a, um, a WorkSafe reportable event that included um, a metal boom from a drag line stri striking an overhead power line. Um, we have indeed worked on some mitigations. Um, both Orion and WorkSafe have subsequently closed their files on the incident. Um, the learning that we, um, from um, ECAN's perspective, was that um, there was a requirement to provide refresher training because whilst our rules did indicate that there was um, a need to obtain a permit, it wasn't specific enough, and so the the operator obtained a permit, but it wasn't sufficient. Um, so we've made lots of changes to our processes. Um, the corrective actions that were identified are being implemented uh, within the Rivers work group, so where the risk lies. And so to close the loop, the health and safety team will go back at a later date and check to make sure that those corrective actions have been put in place. So we'll report on that, but it has been closed. Um, ah, so health and safety in terms of public transport, so the, so essentially the contractors outside of environment Canterbury, that doesn't come through this committee. And I'm wondering whether there's a reason for that, because it, it seems that actually there's quite a big, at, at the very least, reputational risk around that, but also the health and safety outcomes of our contractors, particularly the impacts on members of the public. Is that a discussion that's been being had or should we have around whether those contractor health and safety aspects and their reporting should come through this committee, which is at the higher level as a health and safety, rather than through a committee, board of committees that is where public transport safety comes through at the moment. Yeah, thanks very much for that. You're right. It sits in the contract management side of things. So we have a responsibility as a um, from a joint PCBU perspective. The risk to the public lies with the contractor in terms of the risk bus operators or so on and so forth. Through the contract management mitigations and ways of working, it's uh, for us to ensure from a management perspective, we've got the right controls in place. So we're having the right meetings and, ident and talking to the contractor about what is occurring in terms of um, health and safety. Um, in this instance, talking about public safety, we do also have oversight in terms of seeing the issues and things that come up. That sits purely in the public uh, in the um, public transport team. So we do have oversight of that. But the responsibility for the risk and managing the risk is where it lies, which is with the um, the contractor. So we're we're doing what we would normally do in a joint PCBU. Um, arrangement where we will be um, meeting with them regularly, making sure that we have those conversations, making sure that if anything has been raised, if there's been a work safe incident, for example, we'd want to make sure that those things are um, closed out. Um, anything that was seen as being material um, in terms of risk to us um, I just would bubble up to this committee, but at this stage there was nothing. So to, I guess, elaborate and, and, and that will tie into another question I have around near miss reporting. So, so specifically in our 
transport committee we had a, a there's a little chart that says safety in the corner of the sort of border um, dashboard and there were 20 near misses in there and when further questioning was raised 14 of those are near misses between a bus and a cyclist and so that sort of tucked away and sort of not as clear as it might be and that's where I'm sort of thinking um, that it might be useful to have it raised in a more explicit health and safety type of reporting as we get this committee but maybe it's a question about how things are reported through the committees where health and safety sits in the committee but it you know it was that yeah and it's important for us to understand around those near misses which was uh, do you want to say something on that and then I'll yeah I'd say that's a really good question for the committee the other committee if you've got questions on that because it doesn't sit within ECAN. So if there were health and safety concerns for our own people, then absolutely, if it was a PT team, absolutely it would come here. For you to understand more about what's occurring for the third party is I think what you're saying is not in within the realms of this committee. So you might just want to delve a bit more if you need to in that space. In terms of this, you know driving is one of the bigger risks that we have and that's where the near miss figures were higher and I'm just wondering do we know how we compare with other organizations or or, or you know sort of national kilometers traveled with a near miss incident or you know whether there's some data that we can compare so do we know if our staff and their driving capabilities are reasonable and average or are we a bit more risky and more likely to have an accident or the other way? And is there a way of figuring that out? Because otherwise, what do you do with that near misinformation? Is you saying, well, this is, this is quite risky, but and is this something we should or could be doing more of to reduce that risk? Or are we comfortable with it? We're doing what we need to. I think there's a couple of questions in there. So to go to the what do we do about the near miss in, in, incident information, what we would do is we would have a look and see whether there are any patterns in there. And then the teams and management would just go back and say, OK, do we need to do more training? What is what is it? Um, and is it big enough to warrant it, um, you know, to warrant a change of action? Um, but more generally, it's a good question around benchmarking. Um, we'd have to consider what we would benchmark against um, because Joe Bloggs average, obviously we don't have the data for that, but it's something that we can take away and have a look at and consider the context. Th thanks, Vicky. And just, uh, just picking up on that, um, on the dashboard, there's a, a pie chart which identifies near miss events and it's got eight of them, but what I suppose what we don't know, and maybe that's reported in the, if it is traffic, uh, is what's the breakdown of that? Near misses for what? Is it is it a bus hitting a cycle? You know, what is what is the actual issue? Do we, have, do we ever have that information? Or, or it might be um, injury, illness, I think that's probably that, that, that's probably possibly where that conversation around governance and management comes in. So, you know, the management are looking at those things. We understand the controls that need to be there, and so we'll be having those conversations. And um, you know, with the teams, if we believe that there was an issue that was um, not addressed and was raising the risk, that's that's when we would raise that here. But um, I think from a governance perspective, I'm not sure what additional value that would give you to know what those eight things break down into, but not sure if I'm understanding the question. That was actually the question that I had as my one I lost my place in all these bits and pieces. But it, I think it's around is that assurance side of things. So actually is there all we can see is that there's this many near misses, but we don't know if those are all happening in one particular place or if they're sprinkled around or to what significance the outcome might have been had that near miss not been had, had it actually been a hit, not a near miss. So I think it's just that assurance around, around, you know, is there a pattern and that at what point do you bring something to us or how does that how does that work? Because we're just seeing that information and it raises some potential concerns. So what's the confidence that we how, how do you give us confidence that those are being looked at, that patterns are being tracked? And if there's an issue, then, then the action happens. That's, I guess, what the question is. I think it's part of our ongoing maturity journey. If you think about the workshop we had this morning, which was uh, partly focused on the critical risk standards, 
if you think about driving for work, the primary controls are actually around the vehicle. So do we only buy five-star vehicles? Do we maintain them properly? Do we make sure they've got wafts or they're maintained and serviced? And do our drivers have drive a full driving license? Because everybody drives every day. That's what we're making the point. The additional controls we will put in place are things like making sure you don't drive when you're tired, making sure that. So, you know, we, we can demonstrate through the critical risk standard that we have those controls in place and that the assurance is there that all of our vehicles are off. It's then when you go along the reporting. Actually, management needs to identify that there are, we've had, you know, 47 near misses in the last three months of people driving between Christchurch and Timaru because they're coming back in the middle of winter and they've been working for 10 hours. Well, what are we going to do about that? How do we respond? And so the question is, how do you ask the right questions at a high level? And also, how do we give you that comfort? That we can't stop people driving at 10 o'clock, but we can strongly encourage them to stay overnight. Charles? Um, let's now move to Councillor Caraco has to go, but um, we'll move to 8.9, protective security. Thanks. Thanks very much, Wendy. Do the oh, sorry, do the motion. <laughs> um, no further questions. Put the motion. So the Audit Finance and Risk Committee receives the report on health, safety, and well-being. Over mover. Councillor Southworth, second. Graeme McGlynn. Any further questions? Comment? No. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against <coughs> carried things. Okay, so we'll now move to uh, eight point nine for Questions on there? Councillor Sunk. Just uh, a, a comment the, with the papers that we have had today, uh, recognising, I guess for me, the increasing level of maturity that, that we are beginning to see. We, we haven't reached there, but I'm really quite impressed with the papers that we have. They are really good papers. And so I, I thank you for that. And you know what my question will be if I ask it. Um, how, how do we test? Yes, please. Sorry. For this particular aspect, the protective securities requirement, we have actually got in the diary already a, um, a review or a reassessment of the maturity around protective securities requirements. Um, and that's where we will kind of go back. We have an improvement plan that we're tracking every security forum of where are we with these initiatives. Comes June, we will do that reassessment of the maturity. We will kind of retest what we have done, kind of go and you know, delve a bit deeper and then do that reassessment of the maturity and hopefully show an increase <laughs> in maturity, which we then will report back to you. The questions? Thanks for them. It's good. It's good having this update and the and the uh, and seeing that security policy. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'll put the motion that the Order Finance and Risk Committee notes the work underway to improve environment Canterbury's maturity against the protective security requirements framework. Both Councillor Sunkel, Councillor Robinson. Any further discussion? No. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Uh, against, no. Carried. Thank you. We'll now move to the committee annual work plan on uh, 8.10, page 157. Tanya, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you want to just briefly update us, Tanya, where we're, where we're at with that? Um, so we've tabled this paper because it's the first audit committee of the year. It's just based on what the current terms of reference is. We have put together the work plan for the year. Um, the idea going forward is, is that this Excel spreadsheet or, or this document will be put as an attachment at the front of every pack, just after the terms of reference. Um, Thank you. Very useful. Um, again, feedback from other councils is this is a 
outstanding paper that ends up in every pack and usually changes are highlighted in yellow or red or something so that it's quick for people to see what's what's changed because this is a dynamic world and it ought to change. It's not locked in concrete. We need to be responsive, but that just makes it easy to see where stuff's been added, deferred, changed, deleted. So what is on this plan are very much the standing agenda items. So if there are requests for other papers, those will be in addition to. No further questions, I'll put the motion. Councillor Sunkel. Sorry, we move moved by Councillor Sunkel. Seconded Gray McGlynn. Okay. All those in all those in favour, please say aye, aye. Uh, all those against, no, carried. Thank you. And we'll now move to the last item. The last item, which is 8.11, a report from the chair. Um, I think, um, given the time frame, that we might, uh, if anybody has any questions that they want want to to ask in particular, otherwise we'll pick this up again at the next meeting. Um, I mean, generally the ma the macroeconomic issues are global stuff uh, that were picked up in the Bancor report, and the micro stuff is really our government changes to the Auditor General has some really good documentation. Uh, and a good range of uh, sessions online, um, keeping uh, keeping us up to date with with current thinking from them. Um, so that's pretty much for me at the moment. Um, Graham, I'd add one in there is keeping an eye on things around the edges that are not absolute core, because that's where a cost overruns, fraud risks. Is it part of core strategy? Should we be doing it? Is there risks? Because it's outside core. So look at the edges. That the Audit Risk and Finance Committee receives the report from the Chair of the Audit Finance and Risk Committee. Do I have a mover? Graham McGlynn. Seconded, Councillor Robinson. Any further discussion? No. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. That brings <coughs> our meeting to a item ten. Item ten. The next meeting of the committee is due to be held on the sixteenth of May, twenty twenty four, at one o'clock. <laughs> And um, I'll just I'll declare the meeting closed at yeah, 4.26. And I'll just um, read a closing karakia. Anuhia, 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 kiti, uru, tapanui, otane, kia watia, kia mama, tinako, te tinana, te warua, iti aratakta. Kuya e rongu, whaka iri uria runga, kia tina tina humiei huiei takiei. Thanks for your attendance.